trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Before we go to the episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor, CapChase. Imagine that you could get access to the revenues you'll generate in the next 12 months already today. What would it mean for you? CapChase helps fast-growing recurring revenue companies finance growth without taking on debt or dilution. Whether you want to invest in growth or R&D, CapChase turns your predictable revenue into growth capital today. CapChase has helped founders unlock hundreds of millions in financing to fuel their growth and on average extend their runway by eight months and spared upwards of 16% dilution. So go see how insanely easy it is by clicking the link in the show notes or go to capchase.com slash slush to learn more. Thanks. Let's go to the episode. Hello, hello, listeners and viewers. Welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Paal and next to me, Isa Krautio. I'm here. And we're at the event. So if you are tuning in on audio and you want yeah, to see some here, event actually. vibes, not that many event vibes actually, we're in a cube at the moment, but it's a pretty cool cube. It's a pretty nice cube. Yeah. It's very draggy and it's also pretty crazy. Like this is the Slush podcast and yeah. we just do the Slush podcast year round and now we're finally at Slush. Again. Exactly. This is, uh, kind of what this culminates in. Feels much better. the first it's time here that, that you're doing it actually on the ground. At no, second time actually. Okay. We did one cool. year. Uh, two years ago before it was a corona break yeah. but, then, but this setup is much better that was like very really noisy and, and super hard to concentrate yeah. but hey we'll introduce the third voice voice you already heard so today our guest is Robert Laha welcome thanks so much for having me great to be here guys great to have you uh, as usual we tend to give the floor to our guests so in your own words who are you and, and what, uh, what do you do yeah thanks for having me so I'm, I'm Rob founder of Visionaries Club and uh, Visionaries Club is a Basically, the venture capital fund that we would have always loved to have when we were still founders. So we are all former founders that uh, basically work with Visionaries Club. And it's a 200 million Berlin based VC fund focusing on early stage investments across Europe, pretty much structured as any other VC fund. I think the main difference compared to other funds is that we only have very successful entrepreneurs as our investors. So we have 30 unicorn founders like the founders of UiPath, Skype, HelloFresh, Flixbus, so people who've built great digital companies in a short time. But also on the other side, uh, 20 family business entrepreneurs, so people who are deeply rooted in the old economy. And the reason why we've built the fund that way is that we've all been former entrepreneurs ourselves before. And we think that network and access is actually the most important maybe ingredient that you can provide to startup companies to help them get their companies to the next stage. And that's why we just built the whole ecosystem of Visionaries Club around these, uh, this, this, this idea. And, also, we are in our heart, uh, if you look at Sebastian and myself, who founded Visionaries Club, we are founders and we, we, we get joy from working with entrepreneurs. So we don't really see us that much as investors, but more love being co-entrepreneurs with founders at the early stage that we back. So that's a little bit the idea of Visionaries. And I mean, my, my background long term, I don't want to bore you with a <laughs> no, please go. long story. So I studied uh, engineering and business first in Germany, yep. which was very deep tech focused. And I figured out I was more interested in technology and innovation management in general. So I spent a lot of time in the UK and the US during university, which was a pleasure. Then uh, spent uh, one and a half years with BCG, which was interesting because the person talking me into BCG was Jochen, the founder of Lixbus. So he basically said, hey, don't start a company. First join uh, BCG and then you can still do it. And then after six months, he said, okay, goodbye. I'm doing Flixbus now. <laughs> but he became a very close friend and is also part of uh, Visionaries. And then I was again the mentor of uh, Max Fisman, who is a typical European family business entrepreneur. So total other side of entrepreneurship. He inherited a 100-year-old company with 12,000 employees. But th that was the trigger point, basically, when we figured out, look, there's no connect between old and new economy entrepreneurs in Europe. And there is so much potential, especially for B2B, maybe to build something around this and we did it later but uh, in the meantime I left BCG started my own small company in the mobile space uh, in 2014 which I sold to Zalando the kind of ASOS of the rest of uh, Europe and yeah here we are now now turned VC exactly interesting background story there's a lot there you said something very interesting you said uh, the idea behind Visionaries Club there's this uh, to be the perfect VC for founders the f kind of VC that you would have wanted yourself and then some people could say that the most important thing you can give to an entrepreneur as a VC is money, but do you do you say, do you disagree with this, or do you say do, do, what else is there now? Like there's more capital now than maybe ever out yeah. there, so that's maybe not the thing you can separate yourself with uh, anymore. Exactly, I think you know this has 
in incredibly changed in the last two years because there has been a lot of money going into the ecosystem. All the US funds come to Europe now, which is great for founders because suddenly you have more availability of capital. A lot of new kids on the block, like, you know, Harry with his uh, 20 VC fund, single GP funds like Elad Gill. You have uh, guys like us. You have, I think, an incredible cohort of super angels now, whether it's Daniel Eck, who just led a 100 million Series A round in Helsing. You have Guillaume, you have Tavid that I had on the panel yesterday. So first generation of super angels that can lead Series A, B rounds themselves. And I think for founders, the question is, you know, if the money is available anyway, I think the next question should be, what is the smartest money I can get or the most valuable money? So I think that has really changed that maybe two or four years ago in Europe, there wasn't that much capital. So founder was happy when she or he had money to, to start the company. I, I would take a totally different perspective now. The money is available for any good founder. So as a founder, you better make sure you get the smartest money and the most relevant money. And I think in the seed stage, um, you know, having a network approach like we do or some other great funds or working with angels gives you very smart money or gives you a lot more behind the money. And I would say the money kind of commoditized. Uh, if it's in the later stage, it's funny that things change exactly the other way around. So a lot of our portfolio companies where there is already a strong fund on board. So, for example, if you take Central, it's a company I'm on the board with uh, Luciana from Sequoia. So the founder said, look, I got Sequoia. I got visionaries. I just want to have money now. I don't need another person talking yeah. into my business. So they, they went for Tiger Global in the last round. You all know how they work. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a lot of interesting things that have changed in the ecosystem. Yeah. Has the, like, the terms access and network, have they changed during the years? Like, if you look at... Well, early days of, of, of raising capital, especially in Europe, I remember that, as you said, there weren't that big rounds pre-2010, even pre-2015, it was not that usual. Now you're seeing bigger and bigger rounds, but what is, has there been a similar like path for access and network? Does it kind of go hand in hand also with more exits coming out of Europe and more, you know, entrepreneurs actually succeeding here? Definitely. I think, um, look, there, I could give a two hour answer to this because there are so many things that have changed in the last uh, 12 months in a very positive way. Um, I think the one thing that has changed a lot is that there was a huge shift from consumer internet to B2B founders in Europe. If you just take the German ecosystem, it was focused, focused a lot around rocket internet, business school students, starting companies that have been successful in the US. If you look at now at the deal flow, more than 80% of deals in Germany are B2B founders from tech universities. If you look at Salones, Presonio, or if you take UiPath in Bucharest. So we have a generation of B2B founders that build global category leading companies. And then the network becomes interesting because it's really the old economy that is becoming incredibly important for those companies because 90% of our economy are still family businesses and I think 95% are non-digital. So that's where you harvest the money in B2B. So is that I a think true percentage? 90% are not family businesses. Still. No, no. Uh, more than 80% of the number of companies in Europe are family businesses. Okay, right. And then, um, I mean, more than 95% are not in the digital space right. in terms of the number of companies. So when you, you know, you build a software as a service company, whether it's something like Mio, Salonas or whatever, um, having access to this old economy networks as well early on to make sure you build the right product features, you host your product on local servers and then having those ingredients as well is something that I think should go into the ecosystem and is going more and more into the startup ecosystem. On the other side, when we look at the digital founder value add, I think having this generation of angels now that have built successful B2B companies, whether it's, you know, Hanno is an angel investor, not only in our fund, but also in a lot of our portfolio companies. Hanno Renner, also a by Slash Guest. Exactly, right. of course. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's just gone through all the ups and downs of scaling such a company across Europe. So it's so great for founders, you know, when they scale out of Germany, France, UK, to speak to him or, or get some advice on how to build the sales team, how to build the customer success team. And that's true for any kind of company that you're building. When, when you build your RPA company, speaking to Daniel from your iPad is amazing. And I think... Um, again, to your question in the beginning, if you have those people as angels um, and you get the smartness on top, you can fasten your learning curve so much as a B2B founder. And I think that's a, that's a huge asset. And overall, and sorry, now I'm giving a very long answer, no, but that was fine. a very uh, so we're doing a <laughs> podcast. That's great. Uh, yeah. intense question. Um, I think the other beauty is having all the U.S. fans now coming to Europe, where like two years ago, no one was interested in Europe. I, I recall introducing... Auto One, FlixBus, all those companies when they were in the 
kind of three-digit million valuations two years we see and we're like yeah europe come on uh, not interested and now suddenly sequoia opened an office lightspeed founders fund and everyone and this builds an interesting bridge for european founders to move fast onto the u.s market to get this experience and learnings from those funds get get the recruiting support on the ground and i think that's again an asset to think more global and think bigger because that's a huge problem of european founders if you go to paris or german cities they they think i'm already proud if i'm in the local newspaper or if i <laughs> build a kind of a country leader but um having this kind of nasdaq ipo vision like a ui path or like a salonis or like a miro and um, so the pre-ipo is something that those funds bring into europe so long story short i think it has been an incredible 12 months for the european ecosystem in terms of smart money going into the ecosystem, international money going into it, and um, first generation of serial entrepreneurs that go back to university, tell their story, and really spark engineers to, to start companies. So I guess the question is, why Europe and why now? What's your take on that? Um, I think why Europe, why now? It's um, One big thing is that this shift from consumer internet to B2B is happening globally. So if you look at Silicon Valley and if you speak to the funds, a lot of them say, look, we're sitting at our center road offices and the Stanford students that are pitching each day are getting more and more boring because we're hearing the same ideas and right. not that many great B2B new ideas. So I think when you look at B2B ideas, um, it's getting more decentralized where you find those companies. So you don't just find them in Stanford, Berkeley or in New York or Boston. But uh, if you just look at Europe, your iPath is coming out of Bucharest, then um, Central is coming out of Augsburg in Germany. No one has heard of, about the city before. And Tavit is, is coming out of, you know, uh, the Nordics with Wise. So I think um, what what is happening is that there is a huge shift from consumer to B2B. And that's where Europe can play a much more significant role globally. Because we don't have a Google, we don't have a Facebook, we don't have an Amazon. But we have something that no one else has. All those global world market leaders that are family businesses that are basically the DNA of our European economy. If you look at the French or German economy, it's all those industrial companies that are 100 or 200 years old. And the beauty about this is together they are kind of our Google in Europe because they are the biggest enablement for those B2B companies like a Salonis, like a Presonio, to really get the first uh, traction. And I think a, a great ground to build global category leaders in an authentic way close to the industry. And that's why I think... My hypothesis is that a lot of U.S. funds are heavily going into B2B because it's just at an inflection point and just starting to get as exponential as consumer got 15 years ago. And that's where maybe the European ecosystem can globally play the most important role compared to, to China or the U.S. Yeah, I think it's a, we've had quite a few of, of the yeah. Europe takes because it seems to be a hot potato at the moment, something mm -hmm. that people talk about. But I that's the first uh, like opinion on... or. You're the first person who mentions the the family businesses and yep. the old businesses as an opportunity and not kind of, I say, yeah. a legacy cost or something to get rid of. So I think it's a refreshing <laughs> it's take. It's both, I guess. Yeah. That yeah. sounds very, it just sounds like a very sort of American Silicon Valley type of attitude. Like we, we're coming here and disrupting everything, like yeah. all of this, and not seeing as a cooperative sort of transition. Yeah, which is I think it's both. Um, and, and look, if, if we look back, um, you can always discuss is the glass of water half full or half empty? I mean... Yes, we've been incredibly slow in adapting technologies. Our industry has been terrible in um, getting conviction on, on Im implementing new technologies. And we, you know, it has been just 10 years that I went to university in Germany, uh, sitting there with 2,000 engineering students, and 1,999 of those students wanted to work for BMW or Porsche because we never had a guest speaker that told the story of building a tech company. But now 50% of those students in Munich or Aachen want to start a company. Yeah, same here in Helsinki. Same here, same here in Helsinki. Yeah. And this is an incredible asset because we have such great tech universities in Europe, whether it's Zurich, whether it's, you know, the whole Cambridge, Oxford, London ecosystem. And or it's, if it's uh, Helsinki, the Nordics, I mean, there are, there are such great tech universities. And now we have a generation of students that starts companies. And that's why I think we should rather take the optimistic perspective now not always comparing us to Silicon Valley and what we missed in the last 15 years. Let's be self-confident and see what are our strengths. And then I'm getting pretty self-confident because right now all the funds are coming over to Europe. We have this great students. We have um, the enablement with all those family businesses and the beauty. And here, here's the last quick statement on family businesses, why we have them also on board as investors, as visionaries. They're entrepreneurs themselves from their DNA. That means yeah. they can make fast decisions, take risks, think long term and... That makes them a much better and fast-moving sparing partner than 
listed companies where I sure. gave up because they like <laughs> uh, they they don't have the balls to make a, a decision that maybe pays off in 10 or 15 years. But family business can. So I'm optimistic in the next two years uh, that a lot of those family businesses are moving faster now. A yeah. lot of them will continue to move s uh, slow. But let's see. Let's make them our Google. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I think it's a re refreshing take. What about the more nitty gritty stuff? Say I'm a founder now. I'm looking to to raise capital, and um, I have a good idea, and and you know I. I do some early research, try to look at some funds, have some talks, and there's like a strong indication of interest. How should I approach like thinking about the VC fit for my company? Yeah. Like just step by step. <laughs> well, that's again a very uh, generic question. Yes. I think we're, um, we're giving those. you these two hour questions. <laughs> <laughs> We just paint a picture um, for us. I, I think the biggest challenge for founders, I always figure out also doing mentoring sessions here at Slash is an incredible information asymmetry between what kind of VCs and angels are out there and, and who can I get in touch with. And also I think challenges right now since um, there are so many people starting a company and, you know, market is moving so fast that VCs don't react to cold cold outreach emails but I mean long story short as a founder I think the first thing you th should think about is what is really the best partner when for your company and don't be hyped by anything but try to find the alpha in an investor that can really make a difference at a certain stage so if I would start a company I, I would raise the first round from angels that are really convicted about my space that really convinced about what I'm building and that can give me this little more tailwind and confidence in what I'm doing um, because those people have gone through the entrepreneurial journey they they know your field and and then you can choose you know maybe from from a seed fund that, that you want to work with so if you're a software as a service company there are funds like point nine or local globe or of course us don't want to advertise here that that have done maybe some 50 60 or more than 100 investments in that space so I think speaking to those partners is is great because they really know your space um, I would be a little careful. It's a very active decision if you want to take a multi-stage fund brand in a seed round. So um, what is happening in the market is, of course, since what we just discussed, so much money is going into the market. All the U.S. funds are coming over. If you're Excel Index or Atomic or Sequoia in Europe, it's not as cozy anymore as it was three years ago. So since everyone is fighting for Series A, funds start to say, well, we need to go in seed because otherwise we lose the company. If our competitor seeds the company, it's basically dips on it, gone. But that, that leads to a tricky situation for founders because suddenly they're confronted with trim sheets when they're raising a two, three million round from an index and Excel, a Sequoia or Point Nine or Local Globe and, and Angels and then making the right choice whether you want to go with a multi-stage fund setup, whether you just want to go with Angels. Um, to be honest, there's no right or wrong. We we love teaming up with both. So we just did a deal with Index last last week, which was a seed round where we teamed up. We did another one with like alone. <laughs> so I think as a founder, I would I would just make sure that you have a lot of thoughts and sparing with people that you trust around this and make an active choice and don't rush it. Uh, take the time one, two, three, four weeks really to make this decision because VCs in the current market are trying to be incredibly pushy and yeah. pushing you to sign a term sheet and I think the more they push the, the the less good typically they are because then they have not have the confidence that they're good enough that the founder will even when when they spoke to all the funds uh, choose it yeah. does that make sense that or otherwise sense. Happy, if, sense. if you want to uh, uh, be, be more specific about something I have happy a more to specific touch follow up yeah actually, sure yeah, after uh, about that and this is about the some of the other benefits you can you might get from a venture capitalist uh how, like, what is the role of network and access these days, mm -hmm. and how does this play out? How should you think about that in terms of uh, what VC you choose? Or yeah, okay, yeah. I think as a you know, also having been a former founder um, myself, um, when you're a founder, you have to solve an incredible amount of complexity because you're building a company that is not there yet, with a product that is not there yet, sometimes with a market that is not there yet, and the team is also not there yet. So you need to build everything from scratch and maybe do a hundred important decisions a day. And the more good input you get from connecting dots around you that are as smart as possible, I think the better decisions you can make. It doesn't mean that people tell you what to do, but um, if you do an A-B testing and you take setup A where you have 100, 10 out of 10 smart people with different backgrounds, that you can ask for advice, and in setup B, you don't have those people. Then I think in setup A, 
you have a better ground to make good decisions as a founder with all those complex decisions that can all be game changing. That's why I think having an investor that can provide network and access, very focused on those challenges that you need to solve, is the best ingredient that you can get as a seed founder. What this is very much depends on your company. So if you need advice on entrepreneurship in general, it's good to speak to people who've gone from seed, series A, even to IPO. If it's like a, a topic-based thing, if you're in crypto or you need a certain, or if it's biotech and you need a certain vertical experience, it's great to have a person who can navigate you a little bit through this space. So that's why that's why we've built visionaries just around this kind of diversity of very different entrepreneurs. And we are more like matchmakers. We don't have all the intelligence ourselves mm -hmm. as partners. Yeah. And it's, it's good that we don't have it because we just try to connect those people at the right point in time. And, and that's what I would opt for as a founder. Switching things around as a VC, um, we're also not just, uh, you know, Boy Scouts and, <laughs> and, and, and just trying to wake the world better. But the reason why we have all those angels from those different clusters on board as investors in our fund is that Europe is incredibly decentralized in terms of deal sourcing. In Silicon Valley, every, every founder just goes to Sander Road and, and done. In Europe, you have, the, you have Helsinki or the Nordics, then you have uh, Bucharest, then you have uh, Berlin, then you have London. Da, da, da. So companies come out of everywhere and it's impossible if I don't speak like 15 languages and if I don't have 20 twins at least, how should I source in those clusters? So the best thing for us is having a Daniel Dines in Bucharest who's having, he's a role model there in the cluster. He's a magnet for entrepreneurs. We just did a deal together with Andre from Miro who's scouted an incredible founder in Russia where we would have never had the chance to get access and seeded him together. Then we, we did a deal in the Nordics that the Spacemaker guys introduced to us, Tillit, uh, that we uh, seeded last year with, with Sequoia and Local Globe. And then we are doing the same in London. So for us, having those local angels um, is an incredible sourcing ground to get access and bridge this information and asymmetry of who's actually there and, and, and who do we, do we want to back. But still, I would say, unfortunately, we likely miss 95% or, or more of, of great founders because there's no way to, to, to get in touch, right? Yeah, that's part of the game, I guess, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. What about the personal relationship with, with your VC? Say you raise a seed round or you have your maybe angel round and then, then you do a seed round with one company. How important is it to find, well, it should be obviously quite important also to find then a, a good match within that fund to, yeah. to actually sync and, and you can someone you can work together with and, and get uh, along with. I think that's, that's maybe the most important question that you're asking because if you're a founder... Um, the investor you choose, it's it's even more important than a wedding because you can't get divorced. People really. say this. People yeah. keep saying <laughs> this analogy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think they're saying it because of a lot of people have bad experience. And uh, <laughs> it, it's worse than a wedding because you just can't no. get divorced yeah. that easy, right? right. <laughs> and that's why uh, I think it's the most important And you choice. might even talk to your uh, investor more than you talk to your partner. I hope that's not the case <laughs> yes. often. But it, it, it happens. I mean... Uh, yes, so. I think it's, someone said that too that's not me that's not me saying that. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> no but very fair enough i mean it's uh if, if you're if you're so into it as a founder i mean that's uh you're you're so fascinated about it but but look it's um it is something where i think it's one of the most important choices in your life because it's the chance of your life the idea of your life and that's why i would never 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 compromise on this decision and really um take a lot of time to do it and the first thing to do is to do a lot of references on the investor that you want to work with. So really try to speak to founders that have worked with this investor before and really try to get a feel for the alpha that this investor can bring. And I think the most important thing is really as simple as it sounds, trust and integrity, because as within a wedding, uh, if you trust each other and if there is a 10 out of 10 integrity between founder and an investor relationship, then you can navigate through any ups and downs that you will have and you will have a lot of them. And so that's why we always take this kind of co-entrepreneur perspective it doesn't mean we always have to be the best friends and drinking beer with our founders i mean we were doing it a lot uh, luckily uh, but i mean as a vc you should also be there to be controversial and to be give very direct feedback but if you have this trustful relationship then you can do this and that's why i think as a as a founder i would select my investor a lot based on the personal fit and feeling that you have do you want to work with such a person and that's even more important maybe than track record or brand of an investor. And 
maybe to warn all the founders uh, about us as VCs, as a cohort, because we're terrible in a way that we're always advertising. We are always having the best track record on earth, the best network on earth. We are always the greatest people. And then um, every VC tells the story. But then it's a huge difference once the deal is signed, who really works hard with the founder and, and who just drops the pen and says, look, let's see how it goes. Yeah. And that's why I would do these references as a founder. And having worked with a lot of other VCs, I have an incredible respect for a lot of VC partners that I'm working on board level with that really work day and night very, very hard with their founders and only do very few investments. But there are also a lot I know that might have a really good brand, but just, you know, until the, the deal is signed, uh, founder speaks to all the amazing Lighthouse senior partners and then they just put an associate in the board and then <laughs> see how it goes, right? <laughs> but I think it's so good. So do those references, then you yeah. can't do anything wrong because then you get the whole truth about a partner. Yeah, but doing the di due diligence in, in reverse as well is, is probably a good idea, not just uh, admiring, admiring the brand. It's like, uh, I remember I was in London once and then we met several investment banks and every bank had in their presentation that they're the number one investment bank in London. Everyone, yeah, yeah but of everyone had, an, had a different like way of looking at <laughs> some survey from there, some uh, something there, something there. So it's it's, a, it's about perspective, I guess. But it's also a funny uh, correlation. It's it's something super not public. But if you look at the performance of venture capital funds, and sometimes as a founder, maybe you get some access via references. I think it correlates a lot with the quality of how partners work. Um, and there's a quite a, a district between how some funds brand themselves and they are perceived and how really the performance is. So some funds, I mean, I don't want to uh, like uh, bullshit around with names, but there are um, quite a lot of podcasty and super funds that are all over the place, but they're just um, basically doing a lot of checks, but don't have the capacity to really spend time with the founders and don't have such an amazing performance. And some other funds maybe that people don't know that well that have incredible performance, but partners are more humble and really uh, spend time with the founders. So I think all things that I would try to consider as a founder. <laughs> it's not always, always the, the loudest one. That's the best one. <laughs> not yeah. always. Uh, what, one thing about the more sort of human relationship between the founder and investor, uh, like, is it, is it, what do you think? I, I know this can't be generalized because human relationships are very complex and they always, uh, they're as unique as the as every single separate relationship in the world. But um, do, do you think, is there a risk to be too close? Like if you, when you involve professionalism in a friendly relationship and you risk getting those things intertwined in a way in which when it's if hopefully not, but if it breaks, it breaks hard. Do you think that's a risk? Or do you think it's more In possible? general, of yeah. course, you always have this risk if you get into a conflict of interest because you're a buddy and you're uh, at the same time an investor, especially when you need to make hard decisions. Um, personally, I think um, as long as you're pretty clear and fact-based in the relationship with your founder. Um, I don't see this risk because you can make tough decisions. And I mean, I can just speak for myself, having now invested in 60 B2B companies. And I would say I have a great friendly relationship with a lot of founders. Just take Hanno that you interview. Yeah. We're investors in Presonio. Well, who couldn't be friends with uh, Hanno? Like, yeah. that's the but he's also an investor in Visionaries again. And we were yeah. having beers together. We're also great friends. <laughs> right. So we go skiing together. But... Um, does that mean that if shit hits the fan or if tough decisions need to be made that um, we wouldn't make those decisions? I think that's what we would both respect in both directions. So if there is a, a follow on round and he tells me, look, uh, it is just the setup that I can't take your full provider or there's like, please understand this. I will look at it fact based and I won't be personally, I won't take it personal and also the, the other way around. And for me, this is the best, most trustful relationship I can have with founders because they see me as a co-entrepreneur that they can share everything with and where we solve the problems together. But where I also make clear that I'll always be 100% honest with my feedback and they can take it. But as long as the feedback is not personal, but fact-based, I think, and I, I give a lot of very bad feedback, like when I, when I, uh, when I think it's right, but founders normally really, really like it because that's what they need or what triggers them to, to make tough decisions. And we're a little bit in a more easy situation with visionaries since we're typically not leading or preempting follow-on rounds. So we don't have a conflict of interest that we kind of need to 
discuss valuations that much with founders, so we are more sitting in the same boat with founders, which which means, for example, if we if founder raises a Series B, Series C round, uh, we are often the sparing partner doing the introductions to the other funds because they are uh, we are more independent. But I think that's the best relationship that we can have with founders, and I think it's the best that the founders can get from us. But here's the one one little thing on top on VCs in general, and uh, also our perspective. Being a seed investor or even an, an early growth investor, for us, it's just about the upside. It's really, really not about the downside. If we invest in 30 companies and we write off 29, it really, really, really doesn't matter if the one company is a Presonio or a Deal or <laughs> a Forto or whatever. And that's that's something, on the one hand side, incredibly opportunistic as a VC because it, it means you're not really there for the founders if really shit hits the fan. I mean, of course, we're always supporting them, but... But on the positive side, it means our key target is just to give any positive impact into the company that helps them un unlocking any positive development. And um, th that puts it into a different direction than private equity. Or, of course, also, if you're a growth investor, you invest 150 million and the company tanks. <laughs> you're in a little more stressful situation to go through through tough situations with the founder than, than we are with uh, with visionary so and i think like on the flip side that also makes it a bit easier maybe for the entrepreneur also mentally that okay i'm part of a cohort of companies and the fund isn't dependent on me because most uh, most companies will fail yeah. like through the statistics and uh, yeah. so i think it's like a good thing to keep in mind that okay even though you fail, no one's going to be like super mad at you or, or disappointed. And there's mm -hmm. always a new chance to do something a along the road. So I think in Finland, we might have also a bit of this mindset that you can't fail. Yeah. And that's why also a lot of people don't try the, the really big things. That's changing now, obviously, with, with a lot of good companies coming out. But in general, that mindset is, is quite prevalent yeah. here. Well, you can, but it's really embarrassing. Yes. You, yeah. 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 Which is not good. No, it's not good. Not you good. Should, it should be okay to fail. That's an incredible, terrible mindset. And it's something very European, uh, very... Finland, German kind of yeah. uh, mindset that you don't want to fail and we have to break it. We have to also be more open about how do VCs invest, how, th that it's just about the upside, that's totally fine to fail and that also founders sharing more of their failures. I think David from Zenda yesterday spoke a lot about yeah. failures because also you always... so to guest. That's yeah, right. <laughs> you always talk about the incredible upsides from, from, from the outside, it always looks perfect, right? Yeah. But from the inside, you don't want to know how many... Uh, companies failed and that that's why I had this discussion with Niklas you know from Atomico uh, a year ago where where we spoke about board seats and also about uh, companies failing and, and how we would deal with it and we came to the conclusion that we are there's no difference like if founders in our portfolio fail uh, I, I love them as much as if they succeed because for me it's just part of the game and it is um, as long as the founder is an in integrity person, yes, yes. and yes, yes exactly. Th I mean, we're we're doing this together, right? And and then let's 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 attack the next company, and and that's why we want to be best friends if companies fail, but also if they go well. But I think the worst thing to do is that if a company fails, they're not talking to the phone anymore. Like, ah, come on, that sucks, and <laughs> that really uh, stresses me. I think um, from if I look at my personal life, every failure was a source of even a so much better next decision. I'm so happy for every fail I had. I didn't know that when I had the failure, I was frustrated. But each fail I had in life was the source of something so much better where looking back, I'm, I'm happy that those failures happened. And I think um, that should be the case for, for any founder. A lot of founders we backed that failed just are so much more resilient and uh, hungry to build the next company. Last question, if you have time. Um, how far should you go with curating the, the VC setup? Say you then go to a s stage where you, you do an A round, that's hard probably maybe to raise from one company or at least B round. You need, at some point, you're probably going to have more than one investor in your company. How much do you need to try to think about the curation between those investors? Is it typical for VCs to not get along and have like a very conflict conflicting interests and then, then ending up to actually like hurting the founder? I don't think so. So I, I think any good VC will take take the ego out of the equation on on the founder bot level. Maybe not behind the scenes. I mean, bit between funds, there is a competition like like with soccer clubs, right? But um, if you take Barcelona and Madrid, um, 
Uh, of course, if you take Excel, Sequoia, all those kind of funds. Yeah, but, but hug then, each, the hug after the game or stuff like you respect each other. But exactly. in the field, of course, it's, there's it, Of yeah. course, uh, yeah. until winning the deal, there is a competition which is yeah. great for founders because it gives you a choice and, and, and the funds need to work hard right. to build their brand. But I've never seen and really never in our 60 investments on a board level or other investments that I heard of that those funds, when they are in the board, uh, kind of take their ego into the board. And that's also because... It's not the VCs that make any decisions. It's the founder that's in the driver's seat and pretty often also have, have the majority on the board. And that's why I think it's healthy to have this competition. In terms of the round syndication, look, it's again, um, I think, very much a question of the stage. I think in the seed stage, make an active decision as a founder whether you want to go with the seed fund angel setup or whether you want to take a multi-stage fund in the cap table. So having a multi-stage fund means there might be some signaling risk for the Series A that other funds say, look, if that fund is not preempting it, then it can't be that great. But it can also work incredibly well that other funds say, oh, this fund is already in, so maybe we want to do it. Other founders say, look, I want to be clean at Series A and, and choose what big fund I want to have on board with a really big check. And then I think the syndication angle is something, it's, it's a trade-off between, on the one hand side, I mean, any dollar you have anyway, if you get more smartness for the dollar, then why not take more smart investors on board? So... Having sometimes two funds can be great or having a little more allocation for angels because you exchange a dollar for more smartness. <laughs> yeah. So mm. let's say you already have visionaries. Yeah. Why, why should you give visionaries in the next round another extra allocation because they already have me as an investor. So why not take another angel instead of my money? Um, but that's a trade-off between don't fragment your cap table with too many voices and people that make it difficult. So I think that's, again, no right or wrong. The, the last thing is I would make sure that those funds that you work with do a conviction investment, that it is a meaningful investment for their fund, because otherwise it triggers opportunistic behavior for a partner. If you take on board one of those large funds or whoever, and they just have 5% ownership, and they will say, look, if it's going well, I'm spending time with you. If not, then it doesn't really mean anything yeah. to our fund. But if it's a 15% ownership or a significant check, they have to justify with the other partners why why it's going wrong or good, and they have to bloody hard work with you. So that's what I would make sure as well. <laughs> Sounds good. Good. Thanks so much for this. Super enjoyable. Super good insights. Thanks for for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for the so questions, much, and it was my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you to the viewers and listeners. See you in the next episode again, and take care until then. Bye bye. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Stay safe.